All right. Well, if you have a Bible this morning and you want to um, join me, we're going to be at Matthew chapter 16. Actually, whether or not you want to join me, you're here for the ride. So, <laughs> But we are going to be in Matthew chapter 16 this morning as we're continuing this series in the book of Matthew. We're just a little over halfway there, uh, and we will wrap up the series the week after Easter. Um, so Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to cover the whole chapter this morning. And the reason for that is uh, I, I plan to only use the end of this chapter, the last couple sections, but the first part and the second part are so interconnected, I thought it was important that we cover the whole thing. So we're going to go through a lot of scripture this morning, we're going to kind of go quickly through the first half, and then we're going to spend a little bit more time in the second half. But in order for us to have the full context, I think it's important for us to read through this whole thing. Now... Just to kind of give you an idea of what's happening at this point in Jesus' life. Now, Matthew is the story of Jesus' life. It's the gospel according to Matthew. It's his story from birth to death. And, um, and then even afterwards a little bit, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven. And um, one of the things that, that Matthew uh, really emphasizes, he gives a lot of, of uh, Jesus' teaching and a lot of his miracles. And so we've been studying kind of some of those parables the last couple of weeks. But we've also been studying this tension between Jesus and the religious leaders at that time. In particular, the Pharisees. Right? Jesus and the Pharisees did not get along very well. They didn't like him very much. In fact, they worked very hard to get rid of him. And what we're going to learn this morning is that that is going to be a continuing theme as we um, study Matthew. And in fact, last week, one of the things that we talked about was how Jesus told his disciples, hey, I know these are your religious leaders, but you need to stop following these guys. They're leading you in, he said, basically, they're like blind guides leading people into a pit. And Ultimately, Jesus is warning his disciples, if you, if you dip your toes in that water, if you keep following them and you keep following me, eventually you're going to get pulled astray. You're going to get led astray. You need to stop following what they have to say. They're not teaching the truth of God's word. And so in this story, we kind of pick up that tension. Jesus had just, he had just healed this Canaanite woman's son, which we talked about last week. And... Um, now uh, we're picking it up in chapter 16, verse 1. Here's what it says. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. All right, now I want to just make two things in that first verse before we move on. Um, first of all, it's significant to note that the Pharisees and the Sadducees were working together because these people were mortal enemies, all right, just, just imagine for a second, just think about this. This would be like if the uh, Republican convention and the, the Democratic convention got together and were started working together against somebody. Like, I mean, this is what's happening here. They're both religious leaders, but the Sadducees were the liberals. They only accepted part of Scripture as as. From God, and they they had they didn't believe in a in a resurrection. Where the Pharisees were on the other side of the spectrum, they were the extreme conservatives, and um, in fact, probably conservative wouldn't be the best word. Legalistic would be the best word to describe the Pharisees. These people were mortal enemies and diametrically opposed in just about every view on political and social life. And now they've found a common cause. You know what it is? They hated Jesus. And so they got together and they came to Jesus and said, hey, would you just show us a miracle? <laughs> now, we don't really like you, Jesus, but we'd still kind of like to see something cool. And if nothing else, it'll probably give us a reason um, to criticize you. So why don't you show us a miracle? Why don't you do something cool for us? And he answered them, this is verse 2, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, 
but you cannot interpret the signs of the time. You know that saying, you've heard it before, red at night, red at morning. All right, now this is a very rudimentary weather report. Like today we have extended forecasts. Uh, they'll tell you 10 days in advance what the weather is supposedly going to be, even though they're wrong 90% of the time, right? But even back then, Jesus is saying, listen, you can tell by the color of sky at night what the weather's going to be like tomorrow, but you can't interpret the thing that you've been studying all your life, the prophecies given to you in the scripture. So if I gave you a sign, what would you do with that? Verse 4, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given. By the way, he was talking about them when he said evil and adulterous generation. I'm sure they appreciated that. Seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And so he left them and departed. Now, Jesus is saying, listen, guys, you can predict the weather. But right in front of you is the fulfillment of everything you've been studying your entire life. You've dedicated hours and hours and hours of your life to studying the scriptures. Many of them had a significant portion of the Old Testament memorized. In fact, that was the most common thing to do since it was predominantly in illiterate society. Memorization was something that was taught to learn the scriptures because they couldn't read it for themselves unless they were educated. And so these are the most educated people. They're the most studied people. And Jesus is saying, you want your sign? Here you go. I'm standing right here. Right? I'm the very thing that's been promised throughout scripture from the moment that mankind sinned. In fact, when, when mankind sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned, God made a promise that one day the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. The fulfillment of that very first promise in the Bible was standing right in front of them and they had absolutely no idea whatsoever. Verse 5, when the disciples reached the other side, they'd forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it amongst themselves, saying, we brought no bread. Uh, <laughs> okay, I, I, sometimes I look at scripture and think the disciples were not the brightest individuals in the world. Like, Jesus is like, beware of the yeast and the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they're thinking, you know what? We didn't even bring any bread. Jesus is mad at us. He's frustrated. It's like, who forgot the bread? Matthew, was that your job? You were supposed to bring the bread. Matthew's like, no, James was supposed to bring the bread. <laughs> I mean, that's not what he's talking about here. But you can tell where their mind is at. Right? This, is, this is the theme. Jesus is always talking about themes that, are, that have to do with the kingdom of God. But yet, even his closest followers sometimes are focused on the things of this earth, on the things of the flesh. Jesus said, Jesus, aware of this, so they were talking amongst themselves, right? And Jesus, fully knowing what they're talking about, says, Oh, you of little faith. Why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? That's got to be irritating, by the way. You're like trying to have a secret conversation with your friend, and Jesus already knows what you're talking about all the time. <sighs> like, we can't say anything, right? There are no secrets here. <laughs> Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000? And of how many baskets you gathered, or the seven loaves for the 4,000, and how many baskets you gathered, how is it that you fail to understand that I'm not talking about bread, guys, <laughs> right? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood. Hello. 
that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So what is this yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Well, like I mentioned, um, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were two groups of, of religious leaders that were diametrically opposed to each other and did not get along at all. And maybe it's kind of a simplistic view of, of their positions, but the Pharisees would have been the conservatives and the Sadducees would have been the liberals. And, and I'm specifically talking about in their doctrinal beliefs, right? The Pharisees held to a conservative view of scripture. They held to a high authority of God's word and the oral traditions and all the laws and then more laws and more laws and more laws. And then the Sadducees held to a more liberal view of, of God's word and a more metaphorical interpretation of the scriptures. And they, they denied certain parts of the Old Testament as scripture. They denied a resurrection. And so um, you have these two groups of people and they're as, as generally happens, their, their doctrinal views bled into their political and social views as well. And so there was a lot of tension in not just their spiritual beliefs, but it also in a, in a very difficult time where the Romans had invaded and controlled the nation of Israel. There was a lot of political tension as well. We don't know what that's like today because everybody gets along and we all think the same thing in this country. Um, <laughs> but here's the deal conservatism and liberalism have their own agendas, right? And that doesn't mean that all politicians are bad people, but it does mean that they don't necessarily have alignment with the things of the kingdom of God. In fact, um, just to emphasize how like leaders can, can be good people, Jesus gave us the example of Nicodemus. You remember Nicodemus? Uh, we read more about him in the book of John, but uh, he was one of the Pharisees, and he ended up being a pretty good friend of Jesus. And he was faithful, and you could see that, that what, he had transformation in his heart. Well, he was a Pharisee. So it's not that all the Pharisees were bad people, but their agenda was different than God's agenda. And so they started adding things not only to believing in scripture and holding a high authority to it, but they started adding to it as well. They had oral traditions. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the Sabbath. This was probably the largest area of abuse um, when it came to the Pharisees. They had so many rules about what you could or couldn't do on the Sabbath. And they had it broken down into detail because some rabbi at some point had this tradition, and so they wrote it down, and now everybody has to do this one thing, even though it had absolutely nothing to do with why God established the law in the first place. And so their conservatism evolved into absolute legalism, right? It was about behavior making them right before God. And, and they were all about the behavior, right? Right? And then there were the Sadducees on the other side, and they taught things that really had nothing to do with God's word at all. In fact, they, they led a lot of people astray in a completely different way. And so you have these two opposing forces, and neither one of them like Jesus. Now, what I found interesting is even though Jesus' teachings were far closer to what the Pharisees taught than the Sadducees, you know what group he butted heads with the most? It was the Pharisees, right? It just goes to show you that if you're basing your hope on religion rather than the truth of God's word and kingdom principles and having a relationship with God and fellowship with him, if that's your end goal, if that's where you're headed, it's not gonna lead you to the right place. And so these, these two groups came to, to Jesus. They tried to trip him up. He left with his disciples and said, listen, neither of these groups are going to lead you to the truth. You need to stop listening to what they have to say. And it's just like a, a little bit of bad yeast can corrupt the whole batch, right? So when... Uh, 
Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, this is verse 13, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, this is the easy question. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now, this is the point where Jesus asks a really difficult question. And um, because I know many of you and I know your personalities, uh, I know that a lot of you would be like, I'm waiting to let somebody else answer that question first because I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to put myself out there. But I know some of you are like Peter, right? And Peter just never missed an opportunity to open his mouth. That's what I love about the guy. And he goes, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, good job, Peter. You got that one right. And like, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And this is where he gives him a new name. This is so cool. He says, um, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, I love this renaming of Peter. This is something that's happened throughout Scripture. In fact, the first incidence that I can think of um, is, is Abram to Abraham, right? Uh, and then, like, we also read about Jacob. He was born Jacob, but God renamed him Israel, right? And he became um, the namesake of his people, um, we read later in Scripture about this guy named Saul who was confronted by the Lord on the road to Damascus. God changed his name to Paul. This is something that God does. He gives people a new name. And he did that with Peter. And you know what? He does that for you and me too. Maybe not your legal name. Maybe not what people call you. But when you come into the kingdom of God, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ... You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And you move from condemnation to life. And so Jesus is illustrating that through the life of Peter. He's saying, listen, you used to be Simon, and you were kind of dumb, Simon, but I'm going to use you to do some incredible things. In fact, your name is going to be Peter, or Petra, which means rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Now, he's not saying, Jesus is not saying that the church is dependent on Peter and his personality. He's saying Jesus is the one that's going to build it, but he's going to use Peter in an incredible way. And when we get to the book of Acts and we read the story of the church of Jesus Christ being formed and developed, there's this incredible movement as the Holy Spirit comes at the day of Pentecost and tongues of fire descend from heaven and somebody starts preaching. It's this stupid Peter guy who can't shut his mouth. <laughs> and the party gets bigger and bigger. It spills out onto the street, and people are wondering what's going on. There are people acting like they're drunk at 8 a.m. in the morning, like, what is happening here? And Peter starts preaching. Out on the streets, 3,000 people come to Christ that day. That's what God can do with someone who's willing to allow him to use him. This is a big moment for Peter. I'm sure he's feeling very proud of himself in that moment. He's patting himself on the back. Yes, I got the answer right. Jesus is happy with me. He's going to build his church on me. I'm, I'm called rock now. I'm still, I'm still not sure if I'd want to be called a rock. Like, <laughs> yeah, I've been told I'm as dumb as a rock before. <laughs> And here's what he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, a lot of people use this as an example to say, well, this is proof Peter was was established as the first pope. He was the, the leading authority, right? That's, that's something that, that you may have heard before. Um, but it wasn't 
that Jesus was saying Peter is going to be the head of the church. In fact, as it came to the administration of the church, as we see in the New Testament, it wasn't Peter, it was actually James that was kind of in charge of that. So th that wasn't his point here. Jesus is saying he's going to use Peter. He's going to be the one that's going to build his church, right? And it's because of what Peter said that's the foundation of that statement. It's his confession of Jesus Christ as Lord. It's his recognition of that that's the foundation for everything else. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone... Oh, actually, I need to back up. Verse 21. Skip the section. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So he began to tell his disciples at this point, hey, we're going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And on the third day, I'm going to raise again. Again, now, the problem is the disciples just, this was too much for them to comprehend, right? They just heard the first part here. They, said, they heard, Jesus is saying, I'm going to die. And so Peter, being the shy, introverted person that he is, took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, by the way, the guy that he just said, blessed are you, <laughs> Simon, <laughs> I'm going to build my church on this rock. You're going to be Peter. Let's go, says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, I know Peter's a knucklehead, but that had to hurt, right? Can you imagine in that moment, Jesus, like, he's like, I'm trying to defend you right here. I'm saying I'm not letting that happen to you. And Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan. Right? You're a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. It's very clear at this point that the disciples are still not getting it. In the sense that Jesus' kingdom was not an earthly kingdom. He did not come to this earth to establish a, a new kingdom of Israel that would overrun the Romans and take back the throne for the people of Israel again. That was not his purpose. That was not his point. That was not the kingdom that he was trying to build. And Peter didn't understand that. He didn't get that. And so that's why Jesus is saying, you're setting your minds not on the things of God, but on the things of man. You're still not getting it, Peter. The battle that is about to be won, the victory that I'm about to have, is not an earthly battle. Verse 24, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, this is interesting that he said cross there. Like, like, we get that now because we have seen the picture of Jesus Christ crucified on a cross. But this was well before any of this happened. Jesus, before he died on a cross, is telling his disciples, take up your cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he's done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who 
will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Faith in Christ will cost you something. Listen, Jesus is saying this follow me thing is not just an opportunity to see some cool miracles. It's just not an opportunity to sit down and get some great teaching or to be recognized. It's not an opportunity um, to, for just all the fun things that come along with, with being a follower of Christ. Making a decision to follow Christ is going to cost you something. Now, throughout history, that's meant a lot of different things for different people. Being a follower of Christ, there are many people that's cost their very lives. With the exception of John, we believe that all of the disciples were killed for their faith. Now, that is a, a sobering thought, that those men that were gathered here, that he was speaking this to them, saying, listen, you're choosing to follow me today, maybe partly because of the wrong motivations, maybe partly because it seems exciting, maybe partly because you just want to be a part of something bigger than yourself. But can I tell you something? There's a price that comes to this decision to follow Christ. And the reality of that truth is still the same. Now, for most of us who live in this country, in a relatively safe world that we live in, the odds of it costing our physical life is very minimal. But the truth of the matter is the same. If you're not willing to lay down your life, to choose to die to your old self and receive the life that Christ has for you. And every single day, pick up your cross and carry that burden and follow Christ. Then you don't understand what he's asking. I mean, if you're looking for a club membership, there are some great country clubs that you can join, right? They have golf courses. We don't have a golf course. I'm still working on that. <laughs> someday, someday maybe, right? Uh, we have party on the patio, but I mean, there are, as good of food as that might be, there are probably restaurants out there that are better. I, I don't know. If you want to pay, that's fine. I mean, if you want a membership, go for it. Right? There are lots of social clubs that you can join. In fact, if you want purpose and excitement, there are a lot of uh, political activist groups that you can join. Um, if you want to be a part of something that, that um, makes a difference in the world socially, like there are a lot of great organizations out there that, that um, dig water wells and that, um, that you know, do uh, incredible things. And they're good things, right? These aren't bad things to be a part of. But listen... The church of Jesus Christ is not a social club. It's not a, it's not a political activist movement. It's not any of those things. It's the kingdom of God. And the cost is far greater than some membership dues. It means you lay down your life and your plans and everything. You say, God, I'll take whatever you give me. My life is hidden in God with Christ. That's the word scripture uses, right? I'm a new creation. I've died to my old self. I mentioned Nicodemus earlier. He came to Jesus. He's like, listen, Jesus, what do I need to do? He's like, well, you must be born again. I'm like, uh, Nicodemus is thinking, That's, that, that could be challenging. Like, what am I supposed to do? Like, go back inside my mother's womb again? I don't, I don't get what you're saying. Jesus says, no. You need to die 
to your old self. Lay down that old life and choose to follow Christ. That means everything is on the table. Uh, that's kind of scary. Uh, you know what? Um, listen, Jesus, you can have a um, percentage of my time. You can, uh, you can have uh, certain things about my family. Um, you can even have some of my anger and bitterness, but I'm going to hold on to a little bit because I, I think I might need some of that for some people that really hurt me. You can have some of my unforgiveness. You can have, you can have some of, of my energy. You can even have some of my money. Jesus is saying, no, that's not what being a follower of Christ is all about. It's saying, God, you can have everything. You can have my family. You can have my finances. You can have my time. You can have my energy. You can have my hurt. You can have my sinfulness. You can have my deepest, darkest secrets. It's all on the table. Now that's difficult. Why do we do that? Why would anybody say yes to that? Well, Jesus gives us the answer. He says, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. So here's your choice. You can have what you want right now. Or... You can lay that down and trust that what he has to offer you for all eternity is far better. Now we can nod our heads in church here and say, that sounds pretty good. That's a good idea. I can do that. When it comes down to that real decision, say, I'm going to follow Christ. It's not an easy decision. I never want to be flippant with asking somebody to follow Christ because it's not a commitment to be made lightly. But if you're willing, the reward is great.